So today's discussion features Jeremy Suri and Rick Kennedy, who will be discussing democracy from a historical perspective, its current state and ways to improve it. Rick is an interim state chair of the Forward Party of Texas and a two-time Democratic candidate for US House. He's a self-described hater of gerrymandering. <laughs> uh, and Jeremy is a, a Meg Brown Distinguished Professor for Global Leadership, History and Public Policy at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he recently um, authored a book on the American Civil War called Civil War by Other Means, America's Long and Unfinished Fight for Democracy. And he's also the host of This is Democracy podcast. So I'm very excited to have you two uh, together today to discuss democracy, uh, because you, Jeremy, have uh, vast knowledge about the history of America and democracy here. And you, Rick, uh, can provide the, the practical knowledge on <laughs> what it is like running, running for office and what it is like leading the forward party. Uh, so it's going to be a great conversation. Um, so I want to start with, uh, with the historical perspective and the evolution of democracy. Right? If we go back to uh, the ancient Rome and Greece, um, we can look at how they thought about democracy. And you can see the, distinct, the distinguished features that those two uh, countries had, where in, uh, in the Greek city-state, they had direct democracy, right? which meant that the people, um, or actually not the people, the white males who were free at the time, were the people who could participate in the assemblies, who were making decisions about um, you know, foreign policy, um, about fiscal policy, um, and versus in Rome, they had the system of uh, representative democracy, where they had three branches of government, the Senate, you know, the consuls, and the judicial branch. Um, which one do you think is a better type of democracy, Jeremy? And did the founding fathers choose the correct type for America? Well, that's a, it's a great question, uh, and it gets at one major point. There are many kinds of democracy, and democracy is always evolving. There's no universal formula for it. Uh, what the Founding Fathers were partial to was the notion of a republic, which was the second of your examples that you described so well, uh, which is a system where you elect representatives uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's impractical if you're a society of millions, now hundreds of millions, for everyone to be making a decision. Uh, it's hard enough to get hundreds of people together to make a decision. Uh, then there's the question about information. Do people have access to the information they need? Do I really want my fellow citizens, even very educated citizens, making detailed decisions on weapon systems, which ones we should buy, which tanks we should send to Ukraine? Um, so a representative system implies that you put people into office who have certain skills and have the time and the access to information and then what the Founding Fathers thought most about that they took from Rome, not from the Roman Empire, but from the Roman Republic, was the notion of virtue, that you should be putting people into office who have a certain moral quality, who represent and understand the deeper spirit of society, that there is actually something to moral representation. Now, for the Founding Fathers, that was not to be religious. They wanted to separate uh, religion and politics but it was to be people who represented a certain virtue. Uh, and that's what George Washington was all about. And he modeled himself on a Roman senator in that sense. This was a good system. It was a system designed also to evolve over time. And one of the challenges that I'm sure Rick will talk a lot about is how our system is not as representative as it should be. This is the problem of gerrymandering. But that's a problem that can be fixed. It's not a flaw in the system. It's a flaw in how we have applied the system, particularly in the last hundred years or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the Greek city-states, um, their, democracy, their democracy failed mainly because the people made bad decisions. Right. Right. They chose to go to war with uh, Persia, Persian Empire, I think. Uh, actually, the, what uh, the really Sparta. Was Sparta. That brings them down as the Peloponnesian yeah. War, right? Peloponnesian the Wars. Yes, which then led to oligarchy and the rule of the 400, exactly. right? Exactly, and plagues. And plagues. Um, right, so well said. Um, uh, so you think that that was the main reason why Greek democracy failed? Do, do you think that uh, there is um, a system that 
stands in the middle between direct democracy and representative that well, could work yes i mean so uh, this is what federalism is supposed to be about with a lowercase f which is to say that there are different layers of government yeah so we all do have more direct say or we should have more direct say in our neighborhoods in our cities yeah uh but less direct say in again questions of war and peace that are being made by presidents and secretaries of state and others so the idea of our system is a mixed system where we're trying to bring out the best of each. But I really want to emphasize it's also to be a system that's designed to adjust. The Founding Fathers did not think we would govern today the way we did 200 years ago. Uh, it's a framework that is to move and adjust. And I think going back to the Greeks, the challenge that the Athenians had was not just bad decisions. Uh, they had a system that had become too rigid. And uh, governments... In what way? Well, it had become too rigid because... You had it, it, it was very easy to uh, ostracize someone. So the citizens could decide to vote someone out of the system. And so someone who made a bad decision in their eyes, someone who became unpopular, became in a sense excommunicated. Ostracism is what they meant. And that actually created more enemies and it depleted. Cancel culture. <laughs> yeah, and it depleted the population of talent uh, that they needed in leadership positions. So if you look at Periclean Athens and then what Athens becomes. 10, 20, 30 years later, it's very different. So their system had to adjust to a different kind of world, a world of rivalry also from other Greek city-states, and they weren't able to do that. Uh, the challenge is, can your system adjust to a changing world? One of the points I make in my recent book is that we did that to go into the Civil War. We've been less uh, adept at adjusting since the Civil War. And, and for your listeners who are not political junkies, as we are, uh, there's a business analogy to this, right? Uh, business works well when the business is adjusting to the environment it's in, not when it's trying to force the environment into its market analysis. Yeah. yeah. Rick, what are your thoughts on direct democracy? Um, Do you think if we were in direct democracy, you would have been successful in your run? Uh, in a way, I don't think... In a way, when you run for office, you're actually participating in a direct democracy as a candidate because the people of your district have a direct have a, have a direct say in whether you make it into office or not. So, um, from that perspective, I don't think it makes any difference whether we are a direct democracy on a grander scale or representative democracy. Um, what the, the real challenge is 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 in the way, as Jeremy says, as we have evolved this system, is that. Uh, the, the folks who are in power are manipulating the way that de direct democracy works through mechanisms like gerrymandering, uh, through mechanisms like all the, uh, all the barriers that they put in place for uh, new parties uh, and uh, independent candidates to get on the ballot. Uh, so um, from that perspective, um, uh, yeah, I, I, um, a direct democracy on a grander scale probably had nothing to do with my run in particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on the rise of populism? I think it's it's a word that's being thrown around a lot. Yes, I mean, I think populism is a word that has a particular meaning, and we have to be careful. Uh, what is the meaning? Yeah, so uh, traditionally, and of course it's never exactly the same, but traditionally populists are candidates who are skeptical of established institutions and try to go directly to the people. So one of the classic populists in American history is William Jennings Bryan. Uh, and anyone who's taken one of my courses knows about William Jennings Bryan. In the late 19th century, he was a very popular uh, political figure. He was a religious figure. And uh, he helped to lead a movement in the United States that was designed to break down the corruption in the existing party structure, the corruption around the Republican and the Democratic Party, and empower farmers and workers to have more say. That's why we created the primary system. So the original primaries in the United States are in the early 20th century, They're designed to take control over candidates out of the hands of the fat cats who run the party and put it in the hands of the people. Um, and so populism, in some sense, is a very good thing. It's saying that politics must connect to ordinary people. That's different from demagoguery. Demagoguery is not trying to help people. It's trying to rile people up to support some pre-existing position you have. The classic case of this is an Adolf Hitler. Uh, no one really thinks the Nazis were populists. They were popular. But they used their popularity to manipulate, to rile people up, to get people angry, to use hate, to empower themselves. Invading Russia was not in the interests of Germans, but it was the interests of the Nazi party. 
And what we're calling populism today is often demagoguery. Demagoguery is an old story, too. The Romans write about it. Uh, many Roman theorists were fearful of demagogues. They saw Caesar, for instance, as a demagogue. Would you say, I wanted to ask, would you say Caesar was a populist? I, I would say And was he the reason why Roman Republic fell? Yes, in part. Uh, not, it's never exclusively one person. Uh, and Caesar was someone who began as a populist and then became a demagogue, in part because he was drunk on power. And that's one of the challenges, right? That someone can begin as a populist and become a demagogue. And that's the danger that we have. I think many of the authoritarians we have today in the world, not in the United States, but in places like Brazil, mm -hmm. Hungary, and elsewhere, they might have had populist origins. They might have really cared about their community. And they might have been correct when they started in pointing to the corruption of the party system in their society. Uh, but then as they accrue power and popularity, Here's the question, are they using that to really serve the people? Or are they using it to empower themselves and their own cronies? And if it's the latter, then it's not populism, then it's demagoguery. Rick, would you say that most populists start with uh, good intentions? Or do you think that they, they start straight away with bad intentions of uh, I don't, I don't know controlling most, the system? Uh, I, okay, I would say that most probably do start with good intentions, but there's certainly examples of those who clearly did not start with good intentions. Um, and I'm speculating a little bit here, but I'm obviously referring to Donald Trump. Uh, I do not believe he ever started with good intentions as far as uh, doing anything more than empowering himself. Do you think that the current system is prepared for people who want to, uh, you know, who, who will be corrupted by power and will want to throw democracy away? I think that's perhaps the most important question one yeah. could ask. Uh, and going back to the founding fathers, going back to the great Roman thinkers and the great Greek thinkers, this is always the central question and the central problem. Any system that is designed for human beings to make selections and choices as we want, we don't want AI making our choices and our political leaders, at least not yet, any system where human beings are making choices is susceptible to human corruption. A human institution yeah. will be corruptible. And so what the Founding Fathers, their real great innovation in the United States was to try to create a system of checks and balances, which operates differently from the English system or other democratic systems. And as a historian, one has to say, over 220, 230 years, that system has held up pretty well. But that doesn't mean it will hold up forever. And what many of us worry about, I know what you talk about in your podcast too, is have we reached a point where there are certain individuals who have figured out how to game the system? Yeah and turn it to their own corrupt purposes and the system is not able to check them. That's the open question of our time. Yeah, 100%. Rick, um, how did religion play a role in, in your campaign when you were running for office? It didn't really, to be honest with you. We weren't, uh, neither and my opponents nor myself were really focused on, on a religious aspect. Mm -hmm. We were more focused on, on, on practical issues and, and, and trying to address those practical issues. Um, Are you Christian? Do yes, you identify I am. as Christian? Yep. So religion was not part of your messaging. No, it was not. It was not. And I'm not evangelical, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. um, it, it was never. I, I'm. I'm an engineer, uh, and I come at things. I come at these issues looking for a root cause and a practical solution. Uh, and that was always my message. That uh, you know, I'm going to set everything else aside, politics, religion, and we're going to look at try to figure out what the root cause yeah. of, a, of an issue is and try to address that and try to solve it. And was your Republican opponent playing the religious game? Was he? No. And, and we should be clear that um, my candidacy was doomed from the moment I declared. <laughs> right? uh, I was in an R plus 15 district. Um, I could not raise money because of that. And, and even if I could raise money, um, uh, if I look at comparative other um, campaigns in similar districts who could raise money, it didn't seem to do, make any difference anyways. Um, my Republican opponents really did not have to run a campaign. They were either an incumbent uh, in the first place or Pete Sessions was a former um, uh, congressman uh, who moved back into the district to run uh, once um, uh, Bill Flores retired. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did not have to mount a serious campaign. Uh, their serious campaigns were in the primaries mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they knew that was the deciding race. Yeah, yeah. That's that's so sad that um, I think what is the re reelection percentage like ninety four percent? 
of, uh, of incumbents get reelected? Roughly, yeah. On average, in the, in the House of Representatives, 94, 95 percent mm -hmm. get reelected, even though the popular, even though the um, uh, the popularity rating for the House hovers around between 15 and 20 percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 90, 95 plus percent get reelected on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And in the 2022 election here in Texas, coming off a of fresh gerrymandering on, uh, after redistricting, um, of all the um, candidates for the Texas legislature and United States Congress, literally all but one incumbent got reelected. And the one incumbent who did not get reelected was, uh, was running against a different incumbent who had switched districts because right. of redistricting. That's crazy. Yeah. So should we talk about gerrymandering? Like. <laughs> you want to get into it now? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, let's let's just mention what gerrymandering is for 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 people who don't know. One of you want to take it up? No, no, you're the expert, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so so gerrymandering historically goes back actually to the English system in the 16th century, what were called uh, rotten boroughs. Mm -hmm. And these were districts that were created in the House of Commons that had no people in them. <laughs> So you could be Lord, uh, you know, we could have Lord or Lady Lucy, and she could have her own space, and she's the only one in it, but she gets a seat that would uh, be a parallel seat to uh, someone who's representing thousands of people in London or wherever else. In the United States, uh, this was first used actually before there even was a United States in the Continental Congress uh, in Massachusetts, uh, Eldbridge Jerry was a Massachusetts politician who was drawing districts that were designed to help elect certain people. Uh, what it fundamentally becomes, uh, at least in the American case, is when we have our every 10-year census, census and we get our new population numbers, it is the effort by both parties to draw the lines for districts in a way that benefit them by maximizing the number of seats they can win. So if we have 100 people and 50 are Democrats and 50 are Republicans, and we're going to have three seats, mm -hmm. what each party wants to do is to create a setup so that they're likely to win two of those three seats. So generally, if the Democrats are in charge, they'll try to create two districts where they have just above the amount they need as a majority to hold those districts and put all of the others in a separate district. Uh, a really good example of this is Austin itself, where we are right now. Austin's a pretty progressive city. It's a city that should be electing a lot of Democrats. Um, Right now, the city is designed so we elect Republicans and Democrats uh, because parts of Austin, little parts, are connected to Houston, San Antonio, to other areas, creating districts. So someone like Michael McCall, who is uh, in Congress and a major figure in the Republican Party and very conservative, um, he represents a part of Austin that has very liberal people in it, but they are at most 30 percent, 40 percent of his district. So he relies on 60 percent of voters who are not in Austin. And so the key point here is you're designing the districts to move people around and create representation of more of your kind and less of the other kind. Mm -hmm. And Mike McCall is my representative in Congress. Uh, he was not um, a few months ago. Uh, Pete Sessions was my representative in Congress. But with the, uh, with the latest census, they had to redesign some of the districts. For instance, the... Um, uh, Brazos County used to be uh, intact in the 17th district, and this time around they decided that it would be more advantageous to split Brazos County into two. Uh, and now Mike McCall represents half of it, and Pete Sessions represents the other half. Um, uh, gerrymandering for me is, uh, of course, there. We use the word gerrymandering. I wish we would stop using the word gerrymandering because it doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. They're rigging elections. We're all, you know, and both parties are doing it. They're they're just simply choosing, uh, representatives are choosing their voters rather than voters choosing their representatives. And, you know, for me, it's part of it is this is a failure of those checks and balances um, because the judiciary should be able to check what's going on. And the judiciary has basically punted this entire issue saying it's too complicated. We can't get our heads around yeah. it. We can't define what gerrymandering is. Therefore, go and do whatever you want to do. Uh, so practically, you may elect the representative and like a month later, redistricting happens and you may get another one yeah. without okay. electing that representative. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, my district did elect Mike McCall, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, again, that was a foregone conclusion, right? What, what more often happens is, and we've seen this in Austin, right? So 
uh, if you live in a part of town that Rick and I, I think, both live in, right? And all of a sudden, you've had an influx of people from other parts mm-hmm. of the country who tend to be Democrats, let's say, people coming from California, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, and that part of the area, the population grows. Uh, redistricting or gerrymandering is when you actually say, okay, well, instead of allowing that area to elect a congressperson, we're going to split up that neighborhood and connect it to Republican areas that have fewer people. But by splitting up this more populous neighborhood, they don't get to elect their person. So for a time, Rick, Rick's house was in a district that wasn't connected to the Democrats around him. We connected to Republicans who were far away. And so that protects the office for those in power. And the, the real problem is the ones who draw the districts are the ones in power. Exactly. So they can arrange that. It's sort of as if, you know, I was able to pick all of my students myself, right? I would have the best students, right? <laughs> but actually what makes teaching interesting is I get students I don't know, students who are different, students mm-hmm. who challenge me, not just the students who I already know like me. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. We're allowing the professors to just choose the students who like them. And Hello. It, I think it really, it really depresses participation. It really per, uh, depresses um, um, uh, belief in our institutions as well. Because in my neighborhood, it is predominantly a democratic neighborhood. But back in 2010, they got gerrymandered in to the 17th district that runs from, ran from North Austin all the way up to McLennan County, all the way out to, to Freestone County, all the way out to Brazos County, and all of the, all of the, um, the rural areas in between. And the gerrymandering now is so precise and so accurate that once you're gerrymandered into a district like that, you are literally facing a decade without representation in the United States Congress. And for all the folks that are uh, in in areas like where I live, uh, they're now into their second decade of no hope of representation in the United States Congress. So it really depresses... uh, belief. And and I think where this also has a big effect is on the extreme behavior of elected politicians. Absolutely. So you take someone like Mike McCall again, right? Um, Even though he has a lot of Democrats in his district, and if you talk to him privately, as I have, he's sympathetic to a lot of what they Mm -hmm. think. He is dependent on the 60% in his district who are far-right Republicans. And so it encourages him in public to take very extreme positions. And it honestly encourages him not to care about what the 40% who are Democrats think. If his district was set up as it should be, though, where it was about 50-50, then he would have to find compromise. That's what you want. You want someone who's elected from a district where there isn't one position that always wins and where they have to be creative and find compromise. And our system of gerrymandering, gerrymandering is actually sorting us into red and blue districts that are almost permanently red and blue, which means there's no reason for compromise. What is the solution to this? Well, uh, there are a lot of possible solutions. Obviously, you want to draw fair districts, right? But it's how do you draw fair districts that is, is the challenge here. And as Jeremy said, the, the, the folks who currently benefit from the current system are the ones who would be tasked with changing that system. So there's absolutely no incentive for them to do so. Um, so you need, uh, you need to attack the problem uh, in a variety of different ways. In certain states, uh, for instance, you, are, um, you can get um, referendum questions on the ballot, right? And you can perhaps force uh, ranked choice voting uh, to be instituted. And ranked choice voting uh, in and of itself, kind of draw, uh, you know, regardless of, of the way the district is drawn, uh, may bring candidates, uh, have to bring their rhetoric closer to the center and closer to compromise. Um, ultimately, again, though, to, to, uh, to draw fair districts, um, I, I think we've got to take uh, several different steps. We, we've, got, we've got to get the judiciary to, to impose some sort of check and balance on what's going on. I'm not sure how we, how we can get that or, or do that. You mean the Supreme Court? I would love it if it was the Supreme Court. Um, but, you know, state Supreme Courts tend to vary in their, in their, uh, in their decision making. So originally uh, the Democrats in New York had drawn uh, a gerrymandered uh, set of districts that I think would have favored Democrats 22 to 6 or 22 to 4. I mean, something crazy like that. Uh, and, um, and their state Supreme Court threw it out and forced them to draw more fair districts. Uh, but the state Supreme Court here in Texas, of course, has taken no actions against, uh, against how um, districts are drawn here. Um, it's really going to take, 
you know, as we discussed last night, it would be great if we uh, actually expanded the size of the House of Representatives. Yes. Uh, you know, that hasn't changed since 1913. Why uh, would it be good to expand it? Well, currently, a, um, uh, an individual representative in Congress represents 750,000, 800,000 people. That's simply, it, 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 any way you cut a district, you're going to have an extremely diverse set of viewpoints in, in a district of 750,000, 800,000 people. So adding more representatives would cut down that number of, uh, of people each representative represents. You'd get finer, grain, finer granularity of districts. Um, uh, and again, uh, you know, the, if we go way back to the founding fathers, and Jeremy, check me if I'm wrong here because <laughs> you're the historian in the room. Um, but at the time of the founding, the, the, the founding fathers had figured about, you know, one representative per 50,000 um, um, citizens. If you allow for, say, improvements in communication, improvements in, in travel, uh, you can certainly uh, see representatives today being able to effectively represent maybe 10 times that number, so uh, 500,000 versus the 750,000 that uh, they represent today, which would call for an increase in Congress uh, of roughly a third than over what we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that would give people, uh, again, these finer granularity of districts would give people more opportunity, of, more, more opportunity to be represented by somebody who actually represents their views. Uh, and um, on top of that, if we could ever get to multi-representative districts where you've got a district that is geographically larger but has maybe three representatives or five representatives, uh, then again, if you've got 500,000 people or uh, if you go for three representatives per district, you've got a million and a half people with very diverse views, at least the minority view in that district has a chance of having a representative in Congress of the three. I think gerrymandering is one of those topics where actually there is a solution, right? Uh, climate change, it's hard, <laughs> right? We're not going to sit here and fix yeah. the climate, right? There are some big, big, wicked problems. Gerrymandering is not one of them. Gerrymandering is a politically difficult problem, but it's actually a very solvable problem. Uh, what we could do, uh, I'll say what I think we could do and then how we could get there historically, right? What we could do uh, and what some cities like Austin have done is to create expert panels of demographers and others and provide them clear criteria mm -hmm. and ask them to draw the fairest districts they could. The first criteria, it seems to me, would be representativeness. We want people to actually be living near their representatives. Mike McCall lives in Austin, but he represents people all along the highway to Houston. This makes no sense at all, yeah. right? So there's that. Then we could say we want to have districts that are balanced. We want people to be encouraged to compromise. So let's create 5149 districts not 60-40 or 70-30 districts. We could emphasize diversity. Many would argue all of this is already in the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is equal protection under the law. Each vote should matter equally. If you're living in an area where you never have a chance to win, your vote doesn't matter. So we could create these panels. Many cities do this. Austin, every 10 years, has a group of demographers who are hired and others who are put on a panel. None of them are allowed to be running for office themselves. None of them can be politicians. They are yeah. experts who study population. And they not only look at where people are, they anticipate where people are going to be moving. And the districts are adjusted for representation on the city council. There's no reason we couldn't do that elsewhere. Some states have started to do that. And we find in those states you get not only more representative individuals elected, you get higher degrees of political engagement, just what Rick was talking about, because people think it matters. Now, how do we get there? Because as Rick pointed out, those in power benefit from this system. It's the same problem with campaign finance. Those who have been rewarded by a system are not going to change it, right? Those who do well in the yeah. college system in the U.S., my students who get into UT, they don't want to change the system. They've benefited from it, right? They've gotten here, right? It works for them. Uh, so how do we change this? I think a new generation of voters, those listening to this podcast, <laughs> need to, uh, even if they're not in the United States, they need to tell their friends, this has to become an issue for them. And we need states to move toward referenda on these issues. We need state legislatures where it's a little easier to mm -hmm. elect people to push for this. States could themselves, without any federal action, decide to adopt a different system. And we have to demand that of our local electors. The problem is most of us don't, because back to the point on incumbency advantage, most people are angry at Congress, but they like the person who's there 
because that person brings things for their district. Yeah. And so if you're a wealthy individual who supports uh, politics and you're trying to do it for the right reason, but you run a business, if you have a dodo brain who's a representative, but yet that person gives you government contracts, you vote for that person. Again, we have to have a higher calling in our voting. So I do think this one's on us as voters. New generation. I, 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 want, <clears throat> I, I, I once had a donor tell me, I don't bet on Democrats or Republicans, I bet on incumbents. So it shows you where the money goes. Typically. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And it's increasingly difficult to create balanced districts because people move to locations with others that agree with them politically, right? So it's harder to find the balance. True, but often those neighborhoods are next to one another. Mm -hmm. So uh, take Austin again for an example, or New York City for that yeah. example. These are two cities that you have definitely sorted themselves. You can predict someone's politics, even within the Democratic Party, based on where they live in Austin mm -hmm. or where they live uh, in Queens or Brooklyn mm -hmm. <laughs> in New York City. And it's probably true for cities overseas as well. Uh, but the neighborhoods tend to be adjacent to one another. That's the interesting thing. So East Austin, which is very different from North Austin, yeah. they're actually pretty close to one another. So what you could do is you could draw districts that... Split it up. Yes, exactly. 50 percent, 50 percent, 50 percent. So geographically, we can do this. Uh, we just have yeah. to have the, the will. Coming back to your original point of virtue as a, you know, as a yeah. qualifier for yeah. office. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about expansion of Congress. I want to know, why was it banned in the first place? Why did we stop expanding it? It's such a good question. Um, so every 10 years... And when was it? Yes, in 1913 is the last time we expanded Congress. Uh, every 10 years, when we did a census, and it's important that yeah. that's required by the Constitution. The U.S. Constitution requires a census every 10 years. The founding fathers were men of the Enlightenment, uh, which meant also they had all the negative views of women and other races that they shouldn't have had. But So we shouldn't make them out to be heroes. But they did believe in accuracy and virtue, and they believed every 10 years we should update how we're organized. And so that's why it's in the Constitution. We have to do a census every 10 mm -hmm. years. And from the founding, from the late 18th century until the early 20th century, every 10 years, we expanded Congress in two ways. We brought in new states. And we uh, expanded the number of representatives in Congress because there were new states, but also because there were more people. Uh, we stopped doing that in the early 20th century because uh, there was concern that Congress was becoming too big. That was the claim that was made, but it's not really why mm -hmm. it was done. It was done because uh, the parties reached an agreement that there was a kind of balance at that moment. Right. And they didn't want to move beyond that. And that this is a real problem. So for the last 100 plus years, We've been pretty static, and there's no reason why we shouldn't have more members of Congress. As Rick pointed out, uh, the intention of the founders was about 50,000 to one. That might be unrealistic, mm -hmm. but we've gone from 50,000 to one to 800 plus thousand to one. And that allows for more bad behavior, because if you have bigger districts, you can play with them more to protect yourself being in power. If the districts are smaller, there's less room to adjust them and manipulate yeah. them. Uh, and just to give people a comparative frame, because some will say, well, 435 members of Congress, that's a lot of people. Uh, this summer, I spent some time working with uh, German scholars and politicians, and the Bundestag in Germany, their, their uh, main house, they have a Bundesrat also, but the Bundestag really is their main legislative branch. Um, the Bundestag is twice the size of the U.S. Congress for a country that is one-third the size of the United States. And if you look at the Bundestag, it's actually more efficient in passing legislation, in some ways more effective. We can mm -hmm. have policy differences. I'm yeah. not saying they make better decisions. They function at least as well, if not better, than yeah. the House of Representatives. Yeah. Uh, I think even in the Czech Republic, we have 275 representatives 200. for a population of 10 million. Wow. Yeah. So for a population smaller than Texas, yeah. <laughs> one third the size of Texas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, it, it makes no sense. Why have we not changed things? It's the same reason we haven't changed the electoral college. It's the same reason we haven't dealt with gerrymandering. No one likes the current system, but no one can agree on what to do. And that is so frustrating from a historian's point of view, because the whole point of studying history is to find ways to make change yeah. in our world. Yeah. And so I, 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 I'm becoming a bit of an evangelist about this, but a new generation of voters have to say that's not good enough. No one likes the electoral college. No one likes the fact that they're less represented as the districts have grown 
it's time to do something about it. Don't just accept the status quo yeah. because it's too hard to change it. We have become a complacent democracy. And that might be a bigger threat than the demagogues. The complacency, the unwillingness to adjust. We're a big company. We're IBM or General Motors. <laughs> and we made great cars for a long time. And we're afraid to try to make the cars in a new way. And it's time we change that. Yeah. And the fact that we haven't changed since 1913 and the fact that you say it's because the, the, the two major parties came to a form of a detente, an agreement, um, is, is a good example of, we, you know, we in the forward party, we refer to the duopoly, right? The, the Democrats and the Republicans just own everything. Um, but others refer to it as the uni party, right? Because even though they have their, their difference in rhetoric and positions and everything else, they often work together to keep themselves in power. Uh, the only thing that we can guarantee that Republicans and Democrats absolutely 100% agree on is that they don't want any other competition in the room, mm -hmm. and which is why they've structured things the way they've structured it. So there has been no bill introduced to expand Congress in the past? Oh, there have been bills introduced. Been bills. Uh, and, and most um, frequently, every session, there's a bill introduced to bring Washington, D.C. in as a state, right. Puerto right. Rico. Yeah. So the easiest way to expand would not even be to mess with the congressional numbers, which we should, but just to do what we had also done about yeah. every 10 years, which is to make states out of those areas where the United States is in possession of the territory, whether right or wrong, and where there are lots of people living there who are American citizens. Um, Puerto Rico has three, more than three million people living in it. It's larger than 10 states, 10 different states in the US, and it has no representation in Congress. When there's a hurricane that hits Puerto Rico and Houston, yeah. Houston gets a lot of money. Puerto Rico gets very little. I wonder why. Uh, that violates the Constitution. Three million people there have no representation. 800,000 people in Washington, D.C. have no representation. Uh, this is a real problem. Why is that the case in the first place? So Washington, D.C. was designed that way initially. Uh, it was supposed to be a, a, a capital city without mm -hmm. any leverage or political corruption, and so it wasn't supposed to be part of Congress, but it wasn't designed to be a big city. The vision was, when it's created at the beginning of the 19th century, um, that this will be a small town that politicians will temporarily come to and then mm -hmm. go home, which was true for about a century. Yeah. Anyone who's been to Washington in the summer knows it's a terrible place to spend in the summer. Before lobbying came into place. Before lobbying. And the New Deal, the growth of the federal yeah. government. When you create yeah. a modern government that is regulating air traffic and regulating electricity and regulating yeah. all, you need people working in the central government year-round. And so it's now become uh, a big city because there are lobbyists and lawyers and others who work for the government or with the government who are there. Puerto Rico, we acquired as a territory in war in 1898, 1899, like Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, same time in different ways, but it hasn't been made a state. And you will notice a correlation that the areas we have not made states tend to be areas that have non-white populations. But Hawaii also has a non-white population, yeah, and Hawaii, it is a state. Yeah, but Hawaii had a la large population of white planters who had moved there. Okay. So, for instance, when you buy your pineapple, your Dole pineapple, the Dole family, Sanford Dole, yeah. was a, a yeah. w wealthy plantation owner. So mm -hmm. you had white families there that wanted to control the island and then wanted to be a state, similar mm -hmm. to Texas, right? People who moved in. So it was settler colonialism. Puerto Rico, we don't have settler colonialism. You have Puerto Ricans who have mm -hmm. lived there generation after generation. Many of them are patriotic American citizens. They sign up for military duty in higher numbers than other parts of the U.S., uh, but they have not been made part of the United States because right now that would be two more Democratic senators right. and probably four more Democratic members of the House. And uh, need I say more? That's why right. they're not brought in. But this is horrible. Yeah. This is imperialism. But but the Biden administration is democratic. So why so, would they not want so they more have, democratic so, votes? So they have. They've pushed for this. The Republicans just won't allow it. So Nancy Pelosi, when she was Speaker of the House mm -hmm. in the last session, mm -hmm. a bill was passed actually through, through the yeah. House, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which among other things would make Puerto Rico and D.C. states, mm -hmm. would move them in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the Senate, the uh, Republicans uh, filibustered that. Yeah. Right. And so this is, this is the problem. So the Democrats would need a control of the whole Congress and the government. Or, or to eliminate the filibuster. Right. So the to argument, the and filibuster. that's another whole discussion 
Uh, yeah. The filibuster exists as one of our least democratic practices, perhaps one of the greatest violations of our mm -hmm. democracy. It allows, in essence, 41 senators to prevent any legislation. It's a very strange rule, right? Mm -hmm. That in order to move legislation forward, you have to cut off debate. And you can only cut off debate in the Senate if you have 60 votes, not 50 to win, oh. 60. And if you look at 41 votes in the, in the Senate now, if you align it the right way, as the Republicans have, you can have 41 votes that represent about 25% yep. of the population. Yep. So 25% is stopping yeah. this change. If we could get past the filibuster, we could have Puerto Rico as a state tomorrow, Washington, D.C. One could make an argument also for the Virgin Islands, Marshall Islands, other possessions the United States have. I'd point out also that Europeans are far ahead of us on this, right? Uh, France, Britain, mm -hmm. they've long had possessions, territories that all have representation in the Assemblée Nationale, in the House of Commons. Uh, so this is another case where we're the greatest democracy, perhaps with some of the least democratic uh, activities. Mm -hmm. So how do we solve it? How do we get rid of the filibuster? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same challenge. Jeremy talks about the problems yeah. and, and Rick talks about the solutions. <laughs> it, 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 it's all the same challenge, right? The filibuster benefits the parties in a way, right? Um, that, that it's not in their best interest to get rid of it. When you, when you look at it politically, um, The, the Democrats can say, well, we passed a bill, and speaking to the Democratic constituency, we passed a bill to give statehood to Washington, D.C. Uh, and Puerto Rico, uh, but those guys blocked it, right? Those guys blocked it. And when the shoe was on the other foot, the Republicans can play the same game, or, the, or you can lament about, oh, the filibuster, we can't break the filibuster, so we, you know, we, need, more represent we need more senators They raise money off of it, right? Uh, and, and like a lot of these issues that um, uh, I believe there's no real incentive for the two major parties to, to really fix the issues or, or really come up with a compromise solution uh, like the southern border, immigration, abortion. They raise money off this stuff, right? And, there's a, and they excite their base with these issues. And I don't think there's incentive in place for them to actually solve them. I think Rick is right on this, uh, but I do think on the filibuster it's changing. So the filibuster has so obviously now become an impediment to voting rights, to civil rights protection, as it's always been. By the way, the filibuster has been used most consistently since the 19th century by those who wanted to protect slavery and those who wanted to protect uh, Jim Crow laws. Uh, it's consistently been used against civil rights legislation. Most of the filibusters after World War II were designed to stop civil rights, as it sort of is today. Uh, voting rights or a civil right, yeah? So uh, this has been a long-term problem, but this is a case where it has become now a matter of public consciousness as it wasn't before. Most people didn't pay attention to it. Ten years ago, when mm -hmm. I would say filibuster, my students wouldn't know what I'm referring to, right? right? Now they know, and we are close. I actually think the majority of people still does not know what filibuster is. They may not understand it. They've heard of it, though, right? Yeah, some probably. Sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think uh, for lots of civil rights activists, for lots of young people who care, who are progressive, yeah. this has now become a central issue. And I think if we get a time in the near future where we have 53 Democrats in the Senate, which is possible, uh, we could very well have a vote to end the filibuster. The filibuster is just a rule yeah. the Senate has. It can be changed mm -hmm. by 50 senators plus a vice president yeah. or 51 senators. And we're close. We're close on that. And I think it will change. And it's back to my point. Historically, change happens mm -hmm. when enough people get motivated and enough people make their voices heard, not just by voting, by getting out there in the streets, by talking about this. Every time we see another horrible um, shooting of a young African-American by police, every time we see another act of a horrible mistreatment of people in our society, and we are awakened by that, that puts pressure. Uh, and so I think this is a case where we might be close to making a change. My prediction would be if we could elect 53 or 54 senators from the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying they're perfect in any way, we, they would feel enough pressure, especially those senators who represent states with large populations of minorities and women and others, they would feel pressure on this issue and they could change this. The Republicans already did that. They 
uh, change the rule for the filibuster so that mm -hmm. they could force their people on the Supreme Court. Right. It used to be you could filibuster a Supreme Court nominee. So you needed 60 votes to get someone through. Uh, when the Republicans under Trump wanted to get through three Supreme Court yeah. nominees, they changed the rule. They said you can have the filibuster, but not for Supreme Court. So why don't we say we can have the filibuster, but not for civil rights <laughs> and not for these other things? And that, that would make a difference. So I, I want us to have hope and I want us to see historically that our system is creaky, but you can make change, but you have to be organized and you have to put, pursue it as a citizen. And I, you, I think you make a very good point, and it actually just reinforces me sitting here as, as, as a, a member and hopefully a leader of the forward party, that our thrust is about electoral reform. Our primary thrust is about electoral reform. Yes, people have a right to know how we might stand on immigration or abortion or any of these other things. If we, had, if we had representatives in the Texas legislature now, we'd be voting on those issues right now. So people have a right to understand how we would vote on those issues. But raising the consciousness about our creaky system and how it's not working right now, raising the consciousness about gerrymandering, raising the consciousness uh, about fair representation, raising the consciousness about these arcane rules in both the House and the Senate that uh, basically allow no more than a dozen people or so at the federal level to run the entire <laughs> government. Right. Um, uh, raising the awareness of all of this and how it's not working for the people uh, will hopefully turn this into a fire in the belly issue for, if not older voters and younger voters, who are going to actually step up and, and, and make this change happen. You mentioned forward party several times, but we never really introduced it to the audience. So do you want to say more about it? Sure. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the forward party spun off uh, out of Andrew Yang's um, 2020 presidential run, essentially. Um, Andrew Yang was a Democratic candidate. Uh, Democratic candidate for the United States um, uh, for the presidency. And he, um, uh, he approached uh, problems and issues much the way I approach problems and issues, looking for root cause and practical solutions and compromise and, 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 um, uh, and ways to make things work within the, the constraints and the structures that we have. Um, he did not win, obviously. He did not win the, the primary. Joe Biden won the primary. Um, and after that experience, um, he decided that um, working within the two existing parties was not the way to go, that we needed an alternative. Uh, and so the forward party spun off. Um, he started it in October of 21, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been growing ever since. And in July of last year, we merged with the Serve America movement and the Restore America movement, both like-minded uh, um, organizations, uh, and maybe the first time, and I don't know how long, I don't know if this ever happened before, but uh, organizations actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, from, a, from a legal perspective merged to try to give critical mass to this movement uh, to provide voters an alternative uh, and to, revise, uh, to reform the electoral systems so that we actually have the power to hold our elected officials accountable at the ballot box. We do not have that power right now. We're, it's very slim, let's put it that way. Um, uh, you know, again, in my congressional district, it almost doesn't matter how you vote because the, it, it's a predetermined outcome. In most of the state um, uh, Texas legislature districts, it barely matters how you vote because it's already been rigged. And it's, uh, you know, unless, you, unless you vote in the primary, uh, for the, if you vote in the primary for the favored party in a district, then your vote will count for something. But if you don't, and most people don't, by the way, um, you know, Jeremy, you talked about how M Mike McCall's dependent on that 60% of Republicans in his district. He's really, he's really dependent on the 25% who vote right. in the primary. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so That's right. It's, it's even worse. That's right. It's even worse. So all these folks uh, are are elected by just the slimmest percentage of of the people in their district when you get right down to it, and. Um, the whole movement right now, the forward party movement, is really focused on those electoral reforms because we truly believe that the solution to immigration, the solution to abortion, uh, the solution to all of these hot button issues that we're, we are supposedly so divided on uh, depends on electoral reform in the first place. Because when you look at the polling, and I'll just talk about abortion because we've been talking about this a lot inside oh, yeah. the party right now. 
when you look at this issue and you look at the polling and, and you look at the way the media presents it, the media presents it as this, this country is just black and white, totally divided on this issue. Yeah. When in fact, there's a broad consensus in the middle that you know, a woman should have the right to abortion up to a certain point in her pregnancy. And then it becomes more of an issue of, of, the, the, uh, of the fetus uh, just beyond the woman's uh, uh, control, right? So, and there's 70, 80%. Uh, I think you distributed a poll and 94%? Uh, that was a different poll, but I, I, poll. I will talk about that poll because here in, in the state of Texas and talk about you know, minority rule uh, and, and enforcing uh, the, uh, the view of a very small minority, there's currently a ban on abortion in Texas that does not have an exception for cases of rape and incest. So um, we ran a, a, a poll uh, in the forward party, mostly membership of the forward party. Uh, but there's also been public polling on this issue. And inside the forward party membership, 95% of our supporters support legislation to add an exception for rape and incest to the, to the abortion mm -hmm. ban. Um, they also support a limit on the time when that, 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 um, when you can terminate that pregnancy. And it's probably going to be around 18 to 20 weeks or so. Uh, and the, when you look at public polling, the support is just the same level. It's, it's 80, 85, 86 percent would support, and this is polling in Texas, would support an exception for rape and incest on the current ban on, on abortion. Uh, and yet, that's not the way the law was written in the first place. The law was written to appeal to the slimmest of the base of the Republican Party. And while there are bills pending in the current legislative session to add that exception, uh, those bills are unlikely to even get a hearing in committee, never mind come out of committee for a, a vote on the floor. Because they know based on the results of the uh, most recent election that it's not a great issue for the Republicans. The Republicans are firmly in control and they just want this one to go away for a while. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I mean, uh, the media definitely doesn't help with this, right? It's, it's portraying abortion in a binary manner where you're either completely pro-life or you're completely pro-choice. Yep. But most people are in between and most people agree. Correct. Uh, and I, was, I had a discussion on, on abortion last year where we had a group, group of four people and two were pro-life, two were pro-choice. And at the end of the conversation, it turned out that they actually agreed on most things. Right, it, so it's all about engaging in a conversation. Right, and as Jeremy said, if we had if we had more districts that were fifty one forty nine rather than sixty forty or seventy thirty, yeah. then this conversation would actually happen, right? But it's not happening now because the structure doesn't really support it. Yeah, right. the structure makes it hard, and there's no doubt, Lucy, you're absolutely correct. And I've had this argument with many uh, in the in the media at very high levels. Right, uh, they make everything a horse race, and we become more divided because we're told we're divided. I think that's actually the most important bias in the media, by the way. I don't actually think uh, my friends at CNN and elsewhere, they, yeah. they actually are not ideologues. They actually think they're playing it straight. Uh, the professional journalists, I'm not talking about Newsmax and things like that, but the professional journalists, Wall Street Journal, New mm -hmm. York Times, but they have a tendency, in part because it's an easy way to frame issues, of one side versus another, yeah. when most people are not either side. Most people are in the middle, but there's little space for that. And that discourages people, to Rick's point, that discourages people from, from getting uh, involved. Um, I will say that one of the other issues, though, is let's take the, uh, the abortion issue. The vast majority of people are somewhere in the middle. They're not pro-abortion or anti-abortion. Um, they believe there are certain spaces and women have certain rights over their lives. Uh, I have a daughter who's a sophomore in college and... Uh, my gosh, that someone would tell her she had to give birth after some, after, even if she made a bad decision, that, that seems totally irrational yeah. in every way. Uh, I'm not even sure as her father I should have any say in this, right? It's her body. She's 20 years old. Uh, and I think most fathers uh, believe that. I'm, I haven't found a conservative father who doesn't think that their 20-year-old daughter should be able to choose whether she's ready to have a yeah. child uh, or not. So we're in that space, most of us, this middle space, uh, but too many of us don't get activated around this issue because what happens is most of us figure, even if I don't like the law, I'll find a way around it. 
I'll send my daughter to another state. Yeah. I'll pay for her trip. And I think even Because most our, politicians who make those decisions can afford it. Exactly. And even in our for all the problems for our system, we have not still utilized the opportunities we have. Uh, in our districts where we have primaries that dominate who's chosen, we have very low turnout. And here's a strategy one could pursue. Find a Republican district, find someone who's moderate, who's a Republican, get them to run, and mobilize people to come out for the primary. In some primaries, 15% vote. You can shift things. The real uh, perplexing thing to me is why people continue not to turn out. We've seen better turnout, but still nowhere near where it should be. And I have to say, particularly among young voters, Especially since we have open primaries here in Texas, and you don't have to be affiliated with the Democrats or the Republicans. You can, you can vote in whichever primary you want, and you could also put yourself in as a candidate yep. for whichever one. Uh, so, Lucy, you should run. I'm not an American. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I would have otherwise. I would have. By, by the way, there is a bill pending in the legislature that will close primaries and force you to affiliate with a well. party. But um, What is the likelihood of that passing? It doesn't appear to have a lot of support. At this point, so good. It's 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 un, at this point it's unlikely to actually happen. Good, good. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the viability of a third party. Sure, uh, Jeremy, you mentioned in your book very well. You know, Republicans were the last uh, party that succeeded third party, and their central tenet was was abolition, right? And that's why they were so successful. What is the central tenet of the forward party? And you said it's electoral reform, but is that enough to? mobilize the population well, time will and tell make it if succeed it's enough, right and yeah. and this is not there, there's a couple of things um uh, in recent history the, the the third party attempts have all been sort of moonshots for the presidency right and they've failed to one degree or another um, in fact everyone keeps asking andrew yank if he's going to run for president no, so you want to say that he's not or I, i cannot speak for andrew we yank. don't know Um, but I can tell you that there's strong sentiment inside the forward party to not have a presidential candidate in 2024. Um, we, don't, we do not want to repeat the mistakes of the past. We want to grow this party from the ground up. We want to run municipal candidates for city council before we run anybody for president. We want to run candidates for, the te for state legislatures before Uh, we run for Congress. We want to run for Congress before we run, run for Senate. We want to run for Senate before we run for the White House. I mean, we want to build this thing from the ground mm -hmm. up. Um, and that is what, being able to do that is, is what's going to make us a viable alternative, to have that ground game in place uh, and to have the patience to understand that we've got to appeal to people at the grassroots level. We've got to appeal to the neighbor next door right, before we try to convince somebody in Maine to vote for a presidential candidate. Um, uh, and we have to give people that alternative representation that many people are looking for, but they don't have an alternative at the moment, right? There are plenty of folks, I think, who are moderate Republicans in some of these heavily Republican gerrymandered districts who might vote for an alternative but cannot bring themselves to vote for a Democrat. Right, just simply cannot do it. And the same thing in, in, in heavily Democratic districts as well. I think if we can provide a reasonable alternative to these folks, then we have a good shot at being, um, uh, at being a viable, durable, and competitive third party. I think that's a really good strategy. I, I fully embrace that. I think historically what has worked for third parties is to become the second party. And how do you do that? Um, you take advantage of one party collapsing or dividing or fra fractionalizing. Which and one is it? It's the Republican Party now. <laughs> you see this? It's fairly clear, yes. Uh, so what happened in the difficulty the Republicans had electing their own speaker? They won a majority in the House, and they, they barely agreed and really didn't agree. Uh, because what you saw in the 15 ballots, it took the most since the Civil War to choose a speaker. By the way, Nancy Pelosi had the same numbers, and she only needed one ballot. The Democrats are much more unified. It's not necessarily good or bad. It's just the reality. Um, what you saw are two Republican parties. There's the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene yeah. and Matt Goetz and Donald Trump to some extent. Mm -hmm. right? And then there's the party that still believes in fiscal conservatism, that still believes in strong defense, that uh, is what we might call the old party of George H.W. Bush in Texas and, and others. Mm -hmm. And those two parties are at war with themselves, just as two factions of the Whig Party 
were at war with themselves over slavery in the 1850s. What Lincoln recognized was what you can do is form an alternative that appeals on some of the issues that matter most to members of the Breaking Apart Party, and you can pull independence in. Mm -hmm. And so you reform a new party. For a number of years, there still was a Whig party, and then the Whig party went away. The moment that it presents itself to us is for there to be a forward party that comes forward and says, we want the independents, and we want the reasonable Republicans, which is why I think this will work in Texas, not in New York, right? And puts together a coalition there that starts winning, as the Republicans did in the Midwest, in the sub-presidential elections. So winning at the city level, winning at the local level, and then building support from there. Uh, and, and this can happen. Uh, I think going for the presidency takes you off track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but our system is biased to two parties mm -hmm. because it's a winner-take-all system. Right. So the way to become the third party is to become the second party <laughs> and replace it. So if the forward party succeeds in Texas, which I think it can, it becomes the replacement to the crazy right that is dominating so much of our state. Yeah, I'll be interested to see um, if, if and when the Democrats get control of the House again, whether or not a, fraction, or a faction of the Democratic Party learns something from what they just saw with the, with the Republican Party and is a bit more demanding of, of, of their eventual speaker for concessions on a vote to get their vote. Right, we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. It'll be interesting. But, but right now, there's no doubt that, and this is not what we would have said five years ago, the Democratic Party is far more unified. Right. Uh, and the Republican Party is not. I'm not yeah. saying party unification is the best thing always, but at yeah. this moment, the Democratic Party is not the one that's susceptible to the forward party. Yeah. The forward party is going to get its votes, I think, from independent voters and from disaffected Republicans. you agree with that? Yep, yeah, I agree. Uh, although I, I, I hope that there is a... a uh, a slice of, of Democrats who are, are more toward the middle too, who, who have, who feel that the, the party in general has shifted a little bit too far left and would be, again, would be open to an alternative but cannot bring themselves to vote for a Republican. Yeah. Yeah. Rick, what are the demographics uh, if you look at Texas and the members of the forward party? Is it mostly Democrats, Republicans? No, and in, 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 interestingly enough, um, uh, at the uh, at the kickoff event, the, the the convention kickoff party that we held down in, in Houston, in Houston um, uh, Joel Serby actually was up in front of the crowd and asked people to raise their hands. Mm -hmm. Are you a, you know do you consider yourself a, a Democrat or Republican or an Independent? And it was roughly evenly split three three ways. Uh, I I think um, uh, I, I don't have precise demographic information. Um, but I would think that our support, and I'm just guessing, it would skew a little bit more center-right at this point, a little bit more towards, as you said, yeah. disaffected Republicans. Um, but we have, um, you know, we have certainly have, well, I'm a former Democrat myself, so I guess I, I stand as an example. Um, we have some libertarians, too, which is kind of strange, who are, who are not happy with the way their party has gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, and who are attracted to certainly some of the things that Andrew Yang had to say about being efficient in government. Um, so I think I, it's a pretty eclectic mix, I think, although it does probably skew just a little bit center-right. Mm -hmm. As Jeremy suggested, is your strategy to start off in the South and in Midwest and take over the Republican states and then move to the coasts? Uh, my... I can't comment on national strategy because I said I, we might not have even been on at the time, but I'm so focused on building what we're building in Texas, Texas yeah. that I, I kind of ignore what's going on at the national level. Mm -hmm. I'm so wrapped up into what's going on here. Um, I'm focused on being successful here in the state of Texas. And believe me, if we can be successful in Texas, we will be successful anywhere. How can you succeed in Texas? Kind of exactly what, what I described earlier, building this thing from the ground up. Um, what do you need to succeed? What, what are the requirements? Oh, well, um, you need an organization. Uh, you need a, um, a party structure. You need supporters, of course. You need money. Um, and in Texas, it's easy to become a party, a recognized party. You just go to the Secretary of State. You plunk down a one-page piece of paper that mm -hmm. says, I want to be a party. Here's the name of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, 10-page document that outlines the uh, party rules. Uh, and boom, they stamp it, and you're, you're a party. Uh, that's the easy part in Texas. Um, the hard part is actually getting your candidates on the ballot in Texas. And, and the way they've got the, uh, the laws set up in, in Texas, you have a 75-day window that starts in 
this cycle happens to start on March 13th of 2024, uh, to go out and get 81,000 plus signatures uh, on petitions, and that's ink on paper signatures, mm -hmm. um, to show enough support to get your candidates on the statewide ballot. Um, and the real trick there is, if you want to be a forward party candidate in 2024, you have to file your paperwork and declare your candidacy in December of 2023, at the latest. So forward party candidates for 2024 will be filing their candidacies without assurance that will actually be on the ballot. And again, this it's is a lot of risk to take this is for the, a candidate. Uh, well, we actually we've already it is a lot of risk for the candidates, but we we are highly confident that we will get those signatures when the time mm -hmm. comes. And if I could just add, I think I think what's implied by your strategy, but should be said, and it, again, it has historical basis to it, uh, is you need really good candidates. Yeah. And you need candidates uh, who can't win at the state level, but can win in local communities because people know them. Exactly. So a highly respected person. Again, I think your ideal person would be uh, a former Republican, someone who voted for George H.W. Bush and says, I can't put up with this party any longer on the abortion issue, on you know 18-year-olds being able to buy AK AR-15s without uh, any kind of licensing or anything. I can't put up on these things. Yeah. And the candidate you have in there is a buffoon, and some of these individuals are buffoons. Uh, I'm running as a forward candidate, forward party candidate, because I'm a real Republican, and if that person is not a real Republican, vote for me on this. And I think you, you could get a number of people elected to major positions in the legislature and elsewhere, yep. and then you build a party structure around it. The point I'm making is it's actually not ideology. It's issue and candidate. Find one or two issues, as Lucy said, and one or two compelling candidates. You know, the, the former fire chief who yep. everyone loves yeah. yep. in the community. Things of that sort. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the whole ground up approach is that we've got to, you know, you have to start winning and demonstrating at the local level that you're viable and that you can build off of that. This, this is what the Republican Party of the 1850s did. These were uh, Midwesterners mm -hmm. who were fed up with the Whig Party because the Whig Party was allowing states to come into the union in the west with slavery these were uh, small business owners and small farmers and men like abraham lincoln who were laborers actually who had no land and no education and they hated slavery even though they were white because slaves took away their jobs why would anyone pay them yeah if a slave slave helped the rich it didn't slavery helped the rich it did not help poor and middle class whites and so they began at the local level lincoln himself arguing around these issues with compelling local candidates, I think you could do the same thing around the abortion issue today. Abortion it is. Yeah. Uh, Rick, the forward party also advocates for ranked choice voting, yes. which is a, a very important voting reform that would allow more moderate third party candidates to succeed. Can you talk about how it works and why we should adopt it? Sure. Um, uh, under your, you, you know, um, under the current system, you get to vote for one candidate, period. Yeah. Uh, and uh, under ranked choice voting, uh, it, it is exactly what the name says. You get to rank your preference of candidates. Uh, so say there are three candidates on the ballot, you get to rank them. I like this one first, I like this one second, I like this one third. Uh, and um, the way it works is, again, in that three candidate scenario, if uh, nobody, uh, and three candidates elect one person, if nobody gets a majority of those first place votes in the first round, then the, 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 um, the, the candidate who got the least number of first place votes is eliminated from the ballot. Mm -hmm. And the second place votes for that candidate are then allocated to the remaining two. Uh, so no one's vote gets wasted. Every, everyone's ballot counts. Everyone's ballot counts, uh, and nobody's vote gets wasted. And uh, these, uh, you're again, you're able to, like, uh, you're able to express, I'd like this person, but if I can't get that person, then I'll, I will take this person as well. Uh, and um, you get to express a, a relative, um, a relative preference. And your, if your first candidate, your your first choice gets eliminated your second place choice, that vote still actually counts towards, towards determining the, uh, the ultimate winner. And, um, uh, you know, it allows for uh, um, uh, third party or independent candidates to uh, 
uh, to get traction, to get support, to have export, uh, support expressed for them. Uh, and it allows the voters to actually uh, to express a, a range of support for a different, uh, rather than having to pick one, which quite often in this space, in, in the current system, many of the voters feel is a choice between the lesser of two evils, right? Uh, somebody that's been presented to the general electorate through um, the, the, the very partisan primaries of both, uh, of both um, parties. Mm -hmm. um, we saw that in 2019, Gavin Newsom vetoed the RCV bill in California. And I think similar thing happened in Texas, right? So what, what, what's the, what are the chances that RCV bill could be passed? Uh, here in Texas, a, uh, there's a couple of RCV bills um, pending in the legislature yeah. right now. There's a couple of um, uh, citizen redistricting commission bills pending in the legislature mm -hmm. right now. Um, their hope of of passage, uh, they won't see the light of day coming out of of. Committee. That's why we need the forward party. That's why we need the forward party. Well, and and the way we'll get to ranked choice voting is it's not going to happen in Texas first. Correct. It has to happen mm -hmm. in a number of other states. Right. New Hampshire small states yep. that have a tradition of caring about these issues. Uh, so a state, again, like New Hampshire is, mm -hmm. is a great place to think about. Utah, perhaps, actually, strangely enough, right? Um, and there are these curious locations where you can imagine a number of people really wanting this system. Uh, and Evan McMullen, who I know has been involved with these issues, has been pushing for this as well in, in mm -hmm. Utah and elsewhere. And what that would do is create a model that others in other states would look at. See, the problem right now with ranked choice voting is it's something we've never done. Right. So now we have a historical example of something for which there's no history yeah. in the United States. And there are very few examples internationally, and the ones that exist Americans don't know about because they don't pay attention to other societies. Right. Um, and so what we need is a model of how it works. So what we're seeing in New York City is crucial, right? The New York City mayor's race was a ranked choice vote. And there were some problems in calculating and tabulating the vote. But how Eric Adams does, and then what happens in the next time, and the next time, hopefully that becomes a positive model for other cities. Mm -hmm. And then you could imagine this being adopted the same way primaries were. Primaries were first created in the Republican Party in the early 20th century and then copied in other states and copied by other parties. So what we need here is success and then mimicry and people sitting in Texas eventually saying, because I think Texas will be a late adopter, for sure, saying, look at this in these other states. They get better candidates and their votes aren't wasted. Yeah. Why are we still in, acting like cavemen and cave women? Let's, let's get on, let's get on mm -hmm. board. The two big advantages I just want to underline that, that Rick brought up that I think people don't understand. Um, ranked choice voting means that if there is someone who 35% of the public really likes, like Ted Cruz, <laughs> and 65% really hates, yeah. Yeah. that person doesn't get elected. Yeah. And what you end up with is what most organizations do. You find a candidate who can build consensus. Mm -hmm. So the person who wants to be CEO might have a faction that really support them. That's not a good CEO. The CEO is the person who everyone feels some connection to, even if it's not their first choice. So you could get a second choice that 70% like. They don't all think that person, that woman, should be the number one choice. But they all see value that she has. And that person under the ranked choice system uh, is number two and ends up with the most votes and therefore becomes a candidate. And again, if we follow the model of the business community, that person ends up being a much better, much better CEO. It definitely helps uh, women and minorities. Uh, it provides more openings, more opportunities, and provides more of an opportunity for smaller communities to have a say. And then the other thing I would say is it gets us out of this system of having primaries where only a small number of people participate and runoffs mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we just had a runoff in austin for the mayor's election yeah. and i think what 12 percent, 15 percent of austinites yep. in austin texas voted wow that's um, crazy and so it, it makes everything focus on one election and you yeah. can bring everyone out in that one election and everyone's vote counts it makes so much sense and and by the way the you know, millions of tax dollars that supported that election, that runoff election, where 12, 15% of the population turned out to actually vote right. is, is just w almost, almost wasted, right? And you could, you could eliminate that with ranked choice voting. Why is the voter turnout so low? That's a great question. So one of the points I make in my book is that this is not an accident. Um, before the Civil War, we have very strict property, race, and gender limitations right. on who votes. 
uh, after the Civil War, over the course of the next 100 years, most of those limitations are lifted, but we create new ones. And that's the point of my book, which is that after the Civil War, there is a concerted effort, North and South, yep. to hold on to power for those who feared they were losing power. And that's not just a long race. That's a long gender. That's about immigration. Um, famously, as I point out in the book, the uh, Northerners who want to allow African Americans to vote in the South don't want immigrants to vote in the North. <laughs> Because the ones who are elected by the existing population are fearful that the new Irish and the new Italians and the Jews yeah. won't vote for them. Um, and we become remarkably creative uh, at this. We don't actually have a right to vote in the U.S. This is the problem. We have a right to free speech. First Amendment it makes it very hard for anyone to stop us right now from speaking. You can do your podcast, put up pretty much what you want on it. It makes for a vibrant environment. Voting is left in the hands of the states. And all we say in the Constitution are there's things you can't do. You can't deny it based on race. You can't deny it based after the 19th Amendment based on sex. 26th Amendment says if you're 18 or older, you can't deny it mm -hmm. based on age. But we leave space open for so many other mechanisms to make it hard for people to vote. Felons can't vote, even after they've served their terms, right? So you're arrested. Oh, really? Yeah, you're yeah. arrested in, in... In all states? It depends on the state. Okay. Uh, in Florida, for example, um, if... You were arrested as a 18-year-old at high school dealing drugs. It's a felony charge. You'll never vote again in Florida. Um, but we do other things. We create onerous registration requirements mm -hmm. uh, to make it hard. We put the version of gerrymandering with voting booths. We put lots of voting booths in one place and not in others. Uh -huh. This last election in Texas, we added voting booths on the campus at UT. Texas A&M removed all their voting yep. booths. There was no place to vote on campus at Texas A&M. Was it because it would benefit the Democrats? It was because local party leaders didn't want students voting. How do we know that? Because they added voting booths at um, old age assisted living facilities. That's crazy. But this is controlled. That's legal. That's, That's le totally legal. legal. Yeah. That's totally legal. That's the problem. And this, this is an 1870s idea. So when African Americans start voting in Mississippi and in Georgia, they move the voting places outside of the African-American community. Some of them walk four or five miles. Literally, I talk about this in the book. They walk to actually vote. They have to go that far. Whereas if you live in a, in a white planter community, you just go to your post office. It's right there. Uh, or the local school yeah. or whatever it is. So we have a system that allows, encourages. And my point is it's not a bug in the system. Yeah. It's how the system is designed. Uh, it's also designed to make it harder for women to vote separately from their husbands, right? Because they have to go traditionally go to the voting place, right? Rather than being able to send mm -hmm. in a secret ballot, all sorts of things. Uh, we could create a national right to vote in the way we have a, a federal right to free speech. And that would make it much harder for states to do this. The Democrats actually passed legislation for this. Again, How would it look like? It would basically say that... Uh, Having a right to vote means that if there's any reason to try to deny you the right to vote, the burden of proof is on the denier, not on you. Right now, But how do you prove that? Because everyone can go vote. As you say, it's not about having the ability to vote, but having access to right. voting booths. And So this would be the same way um, you have a right to, under our assumptions about a right to education, a school within a certain distance mm -hmm. of where you live, right? And you can sue your city. You can sue the city of Austin right. or the city of New York if your neighborhood is so far from a public school and you can't get to one. Mm -hmm. um, you would then be able to sue and say, you have a right to have uh, mm -hmm. easy voting access that you can get to by public transportation without having to walk, walk four miles. Mm -hmm. I think students would make the case on a college campus of 40,000 people, <laughs> there should be a place. <laughs> totally. There should be a place. But there isn't that because there isn't a right to vote in the way there is a right to free speech, mm -hmm. a right to freedom of religion. Um, but we could, we could change that. We could create a constitutional amendment. I would go even further, though. I think we should require voting. Australia does this. In Australia, you have to go to vote. If you mm -hmm. don't go to vote, you get fined. It's a small fine, but you get fined. Yeah. Everyone, just like everyone has to fill out a tax return, I don't get to say I've decided not to fill out a tax return this year. Uh, everyone should have to vote, uh, but you should have the right to vote for none of the above. All you have to do is go to the voting booth or send in your ballot and check none of the above. You shouldn't mm -hmm. be obligated to vote for anyone, but it is your duty to vote. What would that do? That would take away all the garbage, all the impediments to helping you to vote. Instead, the state would now have an affirmative obligation. In the way they have to send me a tax return, yeah. they would have to send me a ballot or they would have to make it easier for me to go vote. There's no reason not to do that. 
But doesn't it infringe of the freedoms? Because we're a country based on freedom, choice. I still have a right to vote for none of the above. They're not forcing mm -hmm. me to vote for someone. Right. Uh, there are certain obligations of citizenship. I have to file a tax return. I can't say, following the 16th Amendment, uh, also 1913, right? I can't say, uh, you know, my freedom says I don't have to fill right. out a tax return. Some yeah. people say that, but everyone has to do it. You go to jail if you don't. Selective service. So when my son turned 18, or when my daughter turned 18, you have to register for selective service. He mm -hmm. didn't get to say he doesn't want to do that. So there are certain yeah. obligations. You should be free to vote for none of the above. I want to be clear on that. Right. But you should have to go to vote. It would take away from all of the nefarious efforts by both parties to stop people from voting. Here's what happens in Texas every election. Mm -hmm. And similar things happen elsewhere. It's not just Republicans who do this. Uh, but I'll give my personal example. In Texas, you have to register to vote one month in advance. One month in advance. Every election year, I have 19 and 20-year-olds, freshmen and sophomores in my class. Mm -hmm. I teach a class of 300 students coming to me one, two weeks before the election, asking how to register to vote. Yep. Uh -huh. Now, I've told them, and you can say they should understand this, yeah. but I teach 18 and 19-year-olds. I'm lucky if they think two days in advance. <laughs> right? They're thinking on Thursday about where they're going to go party on Saturday. You know, they don't think a month in advance. Who does think a month in advance? An elderly white voter who's registered years in advance, yeah. right? You've moved. You're a citizen. You move from one state to the other. It's a lot of paperwork. My daughter is a student in Wisconsin, and she wanted to get an absentee ballot. Texas, she has a right to vote in Texas. Her residence is still Texas here, right? Our house. Really hard. Mm -hmm. She had to spend hours. That discourages people from doing this, right? Yeah. Let's make it easier. If we made it easier for people to vote, and we also had more representative districts, more people would come out to vote. Rick, what are your opinions on mandatory voting? Uh, I 100% agree. Uh, again, there are obligations to citizenship, right? There are benefits to citizenship, and there are obligations that go along with that. Um, we have all sorts of infringements on our, quote, freedoms, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, you get out on I-35, and you start rolling down the highway at 110 miles an hour just because you think you've got the freedom to do so. Guess what? Somebody's going to pull you over, and you're going to get a hefty fine. I think I should have that freedom, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Not on my <laughs> You're lucky if you're going 20 yeah, on exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so, and, and uh, I think having mandatory voting would incentivize, clearly, obviously, there's a financial incentive to avoid a small fine. But I, I think it would also, you know, we make laws for lots of reasons. We make laws to... Um, to, uh, to provide a disincentive to certain actions, to provide a, uh, an enforcement mechanism if you do violate those laws. But we also make laws as statements of who we are as a society, right? And this would be a statement well, of who we are as a society. And that statement is that we are a democracy. We are a participatory representative government. And you as a citizen have an obligation to not just sit there and bitch about how bad the government is, blah, blah, blah. You have an obligation to get out and participate. So I'd be 100% yeah. supportive. Yeah, democracy requires political participation. Yeah, and, and another part of this that I think some communities are experimenting with, and I'm not sure of my opinion on this because yeah. it's also historically new, but it's worth putting on the table, is providing democracy dollars to every citizen. Uh. Uh, where <laughs> the Andrew Yank idea. Yeah, and, 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 and we're never going to get out of a system where money talks. And money talks in every democratic system. This is not a unique American problem. It's worse in the U.S. because we have more money and fewer restrictions. But it's true in the German system. I'm sure it's true in the Czech system. Every system, if mm -hmm. you have money, you have more influence, right? Unfortunately, that's how capitalism works. Um, but if you then give people the equivalent of money, fiat, that they can use... Uh, in an election setting, it gives them some more influence. So what I believe Seattle has experimented with, mm -hmm. I think Austin is experimenting with on a small scale, is saying that each citizen, each registered voter has, I'm making this yep. up, 500 do democracy dollars. You can't cash that in. You can't take that out of the ATM. But you can allocate that money to candidates. Uh, and I think that could also get people more involved. If I now have some money I can spend on something, now I care about it. You know, when I, when I buy an expensive meal, I'm damn well going to eat it because <laughs> I paid money for it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm paying for the candidate, so now I pay attention. 
and now maybe I vote. I, I don't know, Rick. What do you think about? Oh this? no, I 100 percent agree. Only about two and a half to three percent of the population actually donates money to political campaigns. Uh, and one of the reasons a lot of people don't, well, uh, certainly a lot of people don't because they're cynical about it and all that. But one of the reasons that people don't is because, well, Andrew Yang said it best, to donate money to a political campaign, you have to have disposable income. And many people do not have disposable income that they're willing to, to, to send to a... Particularly young people. Yeah, particularly yeah. young people. Uh, and empowering people to to provide financial support and therefore empower their candidate of choice, um, again, raises the incentive to actually participate in the system. Um, and also counters the amount, uh, the, the huge sums of money uh, that come in from you know, PACs and special interests and lobbyists uh, and, and gives people a, a, um, a, a, a weapon to counter that, that, that overly uh, balance, that overbalance of, of power and money on the other side. Some people actually say that voting should be a license. So the way we have driving license, where you have to pass an exam and be competent to drive, you should have a voting license. So people will take an exam that could be, you know, about basic political knowledge, and based on the results, they would be allocated a certain number of votes, right? And that's where we're getting to, like, epistocracy and the rule of the knowledgeable. What are your opinions on that? I'm completely against that. I think it's a horrible idea. No. Not because, <laughs> not because in theory yeah. it doesn't make sense. In theory, it's sensible that you should have to have some knowledge before you make a choice. And we all know people who express opinions without any knowledge. In fact, often this is an epidemic in our right. country right now, uh, and social media contributes to this, people who are spouting things that are entirely untrue. Uh, and aren't concerned about facts. Some are even elected to office in some of our countries now, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm not against <laughs> encouraging knowledge. I think one of my jobs, if I'm doing my job, is educating students, and I hope all of us in the world of education, uh, about civics, about basic issues. I'm not trying to tell my students to agree with my opinions. In fact, I'll give them a higher grade if they have a different opinion and, and impress me with it. But they should know the facts. They should know that yeah. they should read the Constitution. They should understand how our society works. Historically, in our society, in the U.S., and this has been true in other societies as well, when you create either property requirements or knowledge requirements, those are always manipulated by those in power to keep their knowledge and their people yeah. in power. So we had tests in the American South and even in some other states after the Civil War. I talk a bit about this. And these tests were used to make it harder for certain people uh, to vote. I, I have a, a personal story about this. Um, one of uh, my professors at Stanford when I was undergrad was a man named Lucius Barker, African-American, older African-American gentleman, a uh, famous constitutional scholar. Mm -hmm. And he recounted when he was early in his career voting in the late 1950s in his home in uh, Mississippi, he would go to the voting booth and they would test him on the Constitution. And the answers they were looking for were often wrong. <laughs> either intentionally or because yeah. the people who wrote the tests were, didn't know what they were doing. This happens with standardized tests all the time, right? <laughs> and he would look at it and he realized, you know what, the test questions are designed to make it easier for someone from one background than from another, Yeah. right? But there's no way to argue that. It, I, I experience this when I come into the United States. Uh, I, because my father's from India, I, I don't look as white-skinned as others. I'm not really white. And if I'm traveling alone without checking a bag, I always get asked, why, why were you traveling? What were you doing? You and do. once in a while, they'll ask me, oh, you were at a conference. You were giving a lecture on the Civil War. What happened at Antietam? And I'll say to this person, you really, you really want to get into this with me. <laughs> you want to test me here. But what's happening there is that individual has power over me because they're able to say whether I've passed a test or not. And that kind of power is open to corruption and has been used corruptly throughout mm -hmm. our history. So I want just the opposite. You know, I want to rely on the larger intelligence of a larger number yeah. of people. And then I want us to invest in educating them as best we can. Another idea. What if we make an exam that would test people on basic political knowledge? Uh, it would be optional, voluntary, and we would pay people based on the score that they get on the exam, right? So imagine a month before elections, anyone could take this exam, and we would, the government would pay you money if you score high on the exam. 
So that would incentivize people that may not be that educated to learn and you know get, get basic political knowledge, take this exam and then get a paycheck from the government. I, I haven't even thought about such a thing. <laughs> I, I, I'm all for uh, in, incentivizing people to learn history yeah. and civics, so yeah. I'm all for that. Yeah. Uh, so long as that exam is not controlled by one party or another, so long as it, I mean, this would be my concern, yeah. that the writers of the exam uh, would use that to try to bias the outcome. Why do we yeah. connect that to an election? Why don't we just, here's what I would do, just doubling down on your idea, right? <laughs> Leaning into it more, yeah. uh, Lucy. Yeah. Why not, when you become 18, there's a national exam you can take, not tied to voting or anything, and if you do well on this exam, showing your basic knowledge of our Constitution yeah. and various other things, you get an incentive then. Maybe you get some of your college loans forgiven. That's Ooh, a great idea. Connect it to that, I think. That's a great I'm, idea. I'm just very worried anytime you connect an exam to voting, <laughs> the corruption yeah. that can arise there. Yeah. But sure, let's incentivize young people to learn and let's reward them. I think we should forgive college loans anyway. Uh, this would be another way to do that. Yeah. It, 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 and that sort of touches on civics education in, in our primary ed education system, um, which if I remember correctly, uh, I saw a statistic while I was running, and I can't cite it exactly, the source anyways, but the federal government spends about a nickel per student on civics education. Mm -hmm. I literally knocked on a door in, in, um, uh, up in Waco a couple of years ago and introduced myself. Hi, I'm Rick Kennedy. I'm a Democrat. I'm running for the United States Congress. And the response was, what's that? And this was a person who was of an age they should mm. know what Congress wow. is, right? Wow. So, uh, you know, getting back to basic civics education in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, I mean, uh, I, I, we've gone away. I remember it when I was a kid. I'm 60 years old now, but I remember when I was a kid that we talk about this, and they do not teach it anymore, at least not compulsory. You have to uh, take it as an elective. Uh, and I think it should be a compulsory uh, part of our education. Yeah. I think a lot of um, um, people like freeze with their education in their 20s, right? They sort of have a good understanding, but then... As the law changes, as the representatives change, as politics change, they don't get updated on their knowledge, right? So we should be encouraging them to take these exams every five, ten years or so, so they they know. But yeah, it's 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 a difficult difficult thing to do. I I think we need more lifelong education, is yeah. what you're saying, and it's one of the reasons uh, why I write books and why I love being on podcasts like yours, honestly. Yeah. Uh, because you hope people are listening and learn. It's, it's unrealistic to expect people to have time to go back to school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But are there yeah. ways we can bring knowledge to them? And, and I think that's our obligation as a society. Agreed. Yeah. Um, we live in an age of increasing polarization by some data, uh, wealth inequality and uh, decreasing living conditions by some standards. You know, in inflation is through the roof. Um, we're facing an economic recession. Um, so, and some say that we are on the brink of another civil war. Uh, Jeremy, you wrote about the civil war. Um, what lessons, what, what, what comparisons can we draw from the conditions of America in the early 1860s? And uh, how do we prevent another civil war? Well, great question, and These it is days. one of the reasons I, I wrote this, this book. Yeah. Uh, and, and the title is Civil War by Other Means, which in a sense says... Yeah. that the Civil War is relevant. Uh, my argument is that... You said it's never ended. It's never really ended, right? Yeah. This is where I open and, and close the book. So I don't think we're going to have another Civil War in the sense of another Gettysburg battle or yeah. Antietam. Uh, the country is, is divided, but it's not divided by region in the same way. It's much more divided urban versus rural. Um, so Texas, yeah. for example, has some of the most liberal democratic areas in the country in Houston and Austin, <laughs> Dallas, San yeah. Antonio, El Paso, and some of the most conservative rural areas in the country, right? So how would that work, right? It's not north-south around the issues of slavery. What I think is significant and what I, the whole book is about is coming out of the Civil War, we don't resolve what it means to be a multiracial democracy. That's why the Civil War is still going. And inequality is built into our system. Mm -hmm. Some inequality is good. I'm a believer uh, that the lesson of uh, 100 years of communism is that full equality and forced equality doesn't work. But the opposite is also a problem. 
right? And built into our system, as I show in the book, are certain impediments to actually including and providing opportunity to different communities. And race is only one component of that. Mm -hmm. Our system is designed, as we've just been talking, to give those who have established political influence, continued political influence, and to make it very hard to break in. Very, very hard. Whether you're white, black, male, yeah. female. Our system is designed also to allow those who have resources to bully others. And this is a real big point in the book, that we are a very, very violent society. We are a society where bullying through money and through violence is continually used, and there's very little legal recourse against that. Let me put this very clearly. It is easier to get away with threatening someone with violence if you're an established figure than it is to get away with making a mistake as an 18-year-old and selling drugs. Uh, our drug laws are updated, and they often have huge penalties associated with them, but yet our laws for misusing a weapon, our laws for misusing your power, misusing your money, are very small. Those who broke into the Capitol on January 6th and tried to basically undermine our government, uh, they're being prosecuted under laws from 1871, the Ku Klux Klan Act, whereas drug dealers mm -hmm. are prosecuted under new laws with stiffer penalties. So look at the inequality built into our system. Those are intentional decisions coming out of the Civil War. The losers in the Civil War and others build protections for their power. That's what we're talking about now. And their legacies are benefiting from this. Not their familial legacies, but those who are able to slot themselves into those socioeconomic positions. That's the point of my book. But we can fix this. We can redesign our institutions. Many people who benefit from this don't believe it's right. They just don't recognize it. Yeah. So my book is an optimistic account of how the past continues to shape us. These are the skeletons in our family yeah. closet. And if we, instead of ignoring them, look at them and say, okay, how do we want to change what Thanksgiving dinner looks like? We can actually have a more inclusive society that's never going to be perfect. And I don't even want full equality. But I want more people to have an opportunity, to have a chance. And I think that's where we build bridges. Because I find in my discussions, I've, I've been about 25 cities talking about the book. Mm -hmm. What I find is Democrats and Republicans agree on that. In fact, many Republicans are angry because they are small town business people. And they feel they don't have a chance against Amazon. They don't have a chance yeah. against Walmart. And then those on the left are angry because yeah. they lived in a neighborhood they can no longer afford to live in as it's gentrifying and they don't feel they have a chance. We can talk about how we can make our institutions more inclusive and give more people an opportunity. One place to start is exactly where the book starts, uh, which is to think about what are the opportunities for young people in education? How can we make education more accessible? Because education is power yeah. to some extent. It's one of the most unequal parts of our society. As I point in, out in the book, that's intentional too. Coming out of the Civil War, certain communities invest not only in educating their own, making it harder for others to get educated, to get access to knowledge for power. We could change that tomorrow. And so I think the, the, this continuing legacy of the Civil War is also the opportunity for us to reform today. And I think that's not Democrat or Republican. That's mm -hmm. actually a consensus position. But I would say, on the other hand, uh, education, access to education has never been more equal because of the Internet, right? Uh, there are courses, there are information Absolutely. that's completely for free. I think universities are making their courses free, right? So anyone could literally go online and get a degree or get, get, get the education that's I, I, necessary. I think what's, what's, what's hard, though, I agree, and I'm all for that, Yeah. Uh, which is why I like to do a lot of things online, and, and I think we need to do an even better job of making things free and accessible. But what we learned during the pandemic is there are some people who don't have basic internet access. Exactly. Uh, Seriously. Uh, Seriously. And, and in Austin, Texas, uh, and in many parts of the U.S., and in parts of Europe, too, they yeah. had to, schools had to put school buses out in the street mm -hmm. with internet servers on them and Wi-Fi, and people were sitting, students were sitting right by those, or going to McDonald's to to get online. So I'm, I'm in full agreement with you, but I think we have to provide the foundation. Everyone should have high-speed internet access. Yep. They should Let's make a it a basic human right. Yes. It's a, it, it's a necessity, and again, a couple of, my, my information's probably a couple of years old, but when I was running, 25% um, of farms in the state of Texas had no internet access at all, never mind high-speed. Uh, I live in suburban North Austin. Yeah. Google just dug a trench down the side of my road and lay fiber. 
in, in, suburban, um, in, in suburban North Austin. Uh, so uh, high-speed internet access could be the great equalizer, but it is not equal at the moment. And much like we had to go through the Rural Electrification Act of 1930, back almost 100 years ago, we need a universal um, internetification effort yeah. uh, to, to be able to sew this back together, to, to, to provide, you're right, universities are providing uh, access to more information and more educational opportunities, but that doesn't mean people have equal access to them. Well said. Um, I'm a huge advocate of women's rights. And Jeremy, I would be curious to hear from you. Why did the founders not believe that women were capable of reason? Uh, did they actually believe that? Or did they not include women because of um, economic reasons, societal reasons? I, I think Hierarchy. The, the argument that women were not capable of reason, a few of them believed, but that was more an excuse uh, than anything else. Uh, they did not uh, empower women with anywhere near the equal rights that they should have had for two reasons. First of all, they wanted to monopolize power for themselves. Right. Right. Uh, this, is, this is true of every group I've ever studied. Those who have power want to keep it and want to stop others from getting power. This democracy so many, with limits. <laughs> democracy for my people, yeah. not for your people, right? So that's the most basic explanation. Uh, and the secondary explanation is they were concerned that women and others who did not own property, and you couldn't own property in most parts of the United States as a woman then, um, and that was actually true through the 1970s in parts of the U.S., believe it or not, um, they believed that if you were dependent on someone, that's the phrase they used, that you would not be an independent voter. And so that's why they wanted people to own property and to be white men. Um, but this was a prejudice that served their interests. And mm -hmm. we need to recognize that. We all fall into that. I mean, I think once we get power, we want to hold it for our group. That's why we need a system. And this was the wisdom of the founders, where no one holds power for too long. Yeah. And, and so uh, we have gotten much better on that issue, but uh, we're still uh, far behind. I was just reading about this last night. There's some new studies showing that um, women outperform men, perform men in universities by far, actually by 10 to 12 points now. Wow. Not just in the U.S., mm -hmm. in Europe, in Finland, which is considered the best educational system, it's the Finnish girls that give the Finnish the high numbers on math scores. The Finnish men are about where the American men are, <laughs> in the middle to the bottom. Um, so women outperform men in all educational settings, but still they earn 75 cents to 80 cents on the dollar, and they're still far outnumbered uh, in CEO ranks and things of that. Oh, yeah. And you cannot now argue it is because of a catching up with change, because now we're far enough in that you should see uh, more of this. So there is still a prejudice, and the pandemic exposed this. A uh, much higher proportion of women had to downgrade or leave their professional positions for childcare when schools were closed. A smaller proportion of men did that. So there still is a profound inequality in the way we organize our lives, which I think has a huge effect on limiting female leadership. And that is a legacy from where we started, not just the founding fathers, it's a legacy of three, four centuries ago. We have to be conscious of that and compensate for that. If we're ignorant of that, we don't understand the world we're in. Rick, how will the forward party appeal to women? What's your uh, strategy? Uh, hopefully through the same, the, the, uh, uh, the same mechanisms, the same messaging that we appeal to men. Uh, I, I draw certainly no lines at all. I don't, think, um, I don't think we need to craft a different message to speak to women. Our message is, again, based on um, what we see as the root cause of the problem, what we see are, are, are reasonable um, uh, positions to address those problems. And uh, every, everybody should be able to digest that information equally. Mm -hmm. I would just be concerned, uh, and I, I'm not saying this is the case, but just as a historian who's looked at other cases, when people say that, totally honestly as you have, often that's still the man's point of view, right? <laughs> and so we have to be, I, I, I just I put that's that on fair. the table. I, the, the, I, I just finished implicit bias training at work. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I can't argue against that there may be some implicit bias involved there. Mm -hmm. So I'm also a huge advocate of freedom of speech coming from, uh, again, the Czech Republic, uh, an ex-communist country. Um, some say that freedom of speech is in peril, and actually stati statistics show that it is in decay. Um, um, what do you think about uh, the culture 
in America right now and how it relates to the First Amendment. Do Americans appreciate free speech still? Or do you think we should make more effort to make them realize how important the First Amendment is, you know, with the rise of cancel culture and, and all these movements? So I, I think there are a lot of things that are conflated in that question. I, I, I agree with your, with your, with your premise. Uh, to me, one of the cornerstones of our democracy is the First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, which of course go hand in hand. And one of the things that's protected us through many difficult moments, including, including the Trump years, was freedom of speech. He could never yeah. silence the critics yeah. as much as he wanted to. Right, uh, and in fact, the critics could get more supporters and more interest. The critics them. could silence him precisely. eventually. Precisely, and I think that's how free speech should work. The market silenced him to some extent. Certain markets did, um, and so I think, in that sense, free speech is alive and well. Uh, newspapers like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post—they're doing better than they've ever done. The New York Times now has more than 12 million subscribers. Uh, which is it, it, even ahead of the biggest mm -hmm. podcasts, right? You better catch up, Lucy, right? <laughs> so, um, it, you know, in, in that sense, free speech is alive and well. Now, the culture around free speech is, is the question, right? Because we're in a very partisan moment and because we have people who are exploiting free speech, which they have the right to do, to intentionally say offensive things, none of which is new, but these go in different cycles. Because we're in that space, this creates a lot of sensitivity. And I think free speech is fine in our country right now. It is well protected. But we do need to educate people better on understanding what it means to be a free speech society and how to accept that. And so I do think my students need to be educated a little more in why you have to listen to and hear other points of view mm -hmm. and what are the appropriate, appropriate ways of responding to those points of view. But I want to be clear, this cancel culture argument is exaggerated for political purposes. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of my students, and I spend a lot of time on university campuses, most university campuses, there are of course biases, but there are biases in different areas. The arts tend to be more liberal, the business schools tend yeah. to be more conservative, uh, engineering tends to be more conservative also. Uh, so there are different biases, and people do put themselves in communities where they hear what they want to hear. Um, but for the most part, you can come and say whatever you want on a university campus. Uh, there are people on this campus and every campus who are pro-Israel and some who are pro-Palestine and people arguing both ways. And institutionally, there are very few impediments. Mm -hmm. There are certain people who aren't invited to campus. Um, okay, but that's not actually the real issue. The real issue is, are you able to go on campus and say what you think? And yes, you are. And I don't know many, if any, professors who would penalize you for what you think. That's the reality of it. Uh, The concern about cancel culture is also those who claim to be concerned about the First Amendment, they're not really. They're concerned about uh, their point of view not getting the amount of attention they want. Right. And I say to them, get better at saying it. If you, <laughs> if you don't think you're a racist and people are calling you racist, show us you're not, right? Mm -hmm. Make your argument in a better, in a better way. So uh, I think it's about educating ourselves, which, are, which, which your question implied. But I, I'm not worried about the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about free speech. I'm just concerned in how we learn to educate ourselves to better use free speech yeah. in our society. Yeah, I think to your point, what I'm worried about is our culture. Yeah. I think people are free to say whatever they want. But a lot of them these days are scared to express their viewpoints because they, are, they fear being ostracized in their community, in their university. There's some right. of that, yes. And I think people, first of all, have to learn that they have to be a little more courageous and we have to teach yeah. people to be better audiences. But also, we have to get people to understand often why they are seen as offensive when they don't intend to be. So sometimes it's also on the, on the speaker. You're still free to say what you want mm -hmm. to say. I will defend that. But if you don't want people to be offended, maybe think about the language you're using. That's not a chilling effect. That's how it should work. It should be a market discussion, right? John Stuart Mill writes about this so well, right? We want a marketplace of ideas. But in the marketplace, you don't just get to throw your product and then cr cry when no one wants to listen to it. You can still make whatever product you want. I'm going to cry. <laughs> no one wants to listen. <laughs> I, I want to poke at this from a slightly different angle, and this is a learning from me as a, uh, me as a candidate. Uh, and, and, and you said we need to be better audiences. We need to be, we need to be more tolerant of hearing opinions that don't agree with ours. And um, uh, one thing I learned as a candidate speaking to people who would never ever vote for me was I did slowly learn, uh, to use the Ted Lasso line, to, to be curious, not judgmental, right? 
try to understand where they're coming from. Um, some of the grievances that a lot of people write off is, oh, you're a racist. There's actually some legitimate grievances underlying some of these, uh, some of these people's uh, views and, and certainly some of the reasons why a lot of people were drawn to, uh, to Donald Trump. Uh, for instance, in the year 2000, the counties that voted for George Bush accounted for 46% of our GDP. In 2020, the counties that voted for Donald Trump accounted for 29% of our GDP. So there is a statistic that just shows the huge agglomeration of, of economic activity away from the rural areas and into the urban and suburban areas. And you know, I went through, I spent enough time in enough Texas small towns where the storefronts are all boarded up and these towns are basically dead and their youth has all moved out and the population is aging uh, and spoke to enough of these people to understand that some of these grievances that may express that they've expressed themselves through voting for Donald Trump are legitimate. And I had to open my ears and listen to some of the things that they were saying. Yeah. And one other point I wanted to make, because I think this is really important. If we're for free speech, as we are, I think all of us, I bet most of your listeners, your audience are free, free speech advocates. Let's make sure we're consistent in that. And I say this to people on the left and the right. If you're against cancel culture, which I think is exaggerated, but does exist, you should be against cancel culture, even when they're canceling those you hate. And you should not be for protecting your people from being canceled, but canceling the other side. And that is the real hypocrisy, the terrible hypocrisy in the CRT debates. The same people who are condemning universities and educators and hardworking teachers, I don't mean professors, we have an easy job, it's the teachers who have a really hard job, um, those who are condemning teachers for teaching CRT, which they're not, for teaching some of the things in my book, yeah. some of the harmful parts of our history, some of the parts we're embarrassed by, even those who love our country like me, we're embarrassed by some of this, right? Those who are condemning those teachers, trying to cancel that, then complain when their supporters are canceled. If you try to cancel someone on the other side, you are legitimizing the cancellation of your own side. So we should be, if we're against cancel culture, against it in all cases. And this comes back to, to Rick's point, right? It shouldn't only be that I want to protect those who I agree with. It. I should want to protect those who I disagree with. In fact, I need to protect them more and protect their right to speak. So if you're against cancel culture, you've got to be against any kind of censoring of teaching. Because mm -hmm. teachers should have the freedom to teach the history that they know, not the history that someone sitting in Austin or Washington, D.C. likes. Or Tallahassee. Yeah, or Completely Tallahassee. agree. <laughs> So would you be um, against the Twitter ban on Trump after the January 6th insurrection? No, I'm for the Twitter or, ban on Trump because okay. Twitter uh, is a private company. I'm for right. private enterprise. Right. And uh, there are rules. I'm for Twitter being consistent. They should have banned him earlier. Uh, I, I think they should ban me if I threaten you on <laughs> right. Twitter. If I threaten yeah. your life and I encourage other people and I put your address on Twitter and I tell people to come and find you and do harm to you, uh, Twitter has rules. Now, I have the right to stand on the street corner and say, I hate Lucy. <laughs> Go, right? I have the right to say Give that. Give it to me. <laughs> I have the right to say that. Yeah. But Twitter has rules. Um, and Donald Trump can go to another platform. He created his own. True. His own platform. I say the same in my classroom. I'm for free speech. But in my classroom, you cannot disrupt the lecture. You cannot stand up and play your music and do things. You can do that if you're sitting at Starbucks. I have no right to tell you. Mm -hmm. But in my classroom, we have rules, right? And one rule yep. is a certain civility in a classroom where there is a professor and there are students. You don't like that, don't come to class. Yeah, I completely right. agree. I, think, and, yeah. I, just, I just think people need to be realistic about what Twitter and any of these other platforms are. They're not public squares. They exist to sell advertising. They exist to, make, to create a return on investment for their shareholders, period. And they're going to apply their rules or they're going to create their rules uh, in a way that they hope will maximize uh, that return on investment. It's commercial venture. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I created my own private square. I built a platform that is the opposite of Twitter, that focuses on small private discussions. And Rick, you know of it because the forward party is on it. So yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of... Uh, you know, getting exposure to different perspectives and speaking in small private groups. I love it. Because I feel, you know, that's how we speak in real life. Exactly. Four to five people. We don't speak with 100 people the way you speak on Twitter and in these comment sections. That's not real. 
So, so I'm a huge advocate of that. And obviously this podcast, the aim of this podcast is to promote a culture of open debate and tolerance of dissent. So uh, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, but yeah, last question. I would love to hear your predictions for 2024. Um, who do you think is going to win the primary? Who do you think is going to win the presidency? What's going to happen? So uh, I, I predict that we will have uh, at least three candidates for president. Mm -hmm. That um, Donald Trump will not win the Republican primary, but he will still run. And so if people are looking for a historical analog, uh, the candidates are very different. But 1912, when you had actually four candidates, four very serious candidates, uh, you had uh, William Howard Taft, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, and Eugene V. Debs, socialist candidate who won actually a million votes. People wow. forget that. Um, and Wilson is elected in the same way Lincoln is elected as a plurality president, mm -hmm. not a majority president. I don't think that will be the result. I think Biden will want, will run. The Republican Party will basically be split. He will run. Yeah, I think Biden will run. I think the Republican Party will be split. And Biden will win a big victory, not because he won so many popular votes, but because the Republicans will split their votes. So I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say there's a good chance Biden could win Texas in that phenomenon, because then Trump and DeSantis, or whoever the Republican nominee is, will split the vote in Texas, each getting 25%. And Biden will get what's always there for Democrats, 42%, 43%. It'll be a big victory for Biden. I think the Democrats will win back the House. The Senate, though, will be very close yeah, because of the Senate races. Uh, but I think we'll be in a moment where the Democrats will have another opportunity. And the question will be, what do they do in those two years? Because they will lose that majority in Congress the two years after. They'll have an opportunity. And it'll be an opportunity for parties like the forward party to move in. So I, I predict a very uh, disordered but promising political landscape. I'm an optimist for 2024. That said, though, there still will be a lot of hate, and Donald Trump will be, become even more of a demagogue. He just won't be able to win. He's never been able to win, really. Do you think that third candidate, if DeSantis is the Republican nominee, that third candidate will be Donald Trump running on his own? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. I, think, I, I think Donald Trump will run on his own because he won't accept that he didn't win the Republican primary, right. but also because he'll be, he'll be indicted. I don't know where, either in Georgia, New York, federal government, and he will see running as protection because he will say, I'm being indicted because I'm a candidate. And so there's nothing in his background that tells us he does anything but what's in his own interests. Yeah. And, uh, and so he will split the party. He, will, he might be the best asset the Democrats have yeah. right now. I agree that Biden will, will run again unless something happens with his health, yeah. right? Uh, and, and then he can't, and then that throws yeah. it wide open on the, on the Democrats. Gerontocracy, side. presidential succession, it, right? Who's going to? I, I don't know. You know I, I mean, you can wind up with 12, Democrats, uh, 12, 12 candidates on the Democratic side and 12 candidates on the Republican side, and it's a primary free-for-all. Yeah. You know, I think if Biden runs in 2024 or if he wins the primary, we should pay attention who the vice president will yes. be yes. because it's very likely that the vice president will then become president yes. Yes. I think that's right. in Absolutely. his term. I think that's if Biden runs, he won't have, I, I don't think he'll have serious primary uh, yeah. opposition. Um, he's got too much support at this point in the, in the Democratic Party. Yeah, yeah, well said. Well, yeah, thank you so much both for coming on the podcast. Thank you. We're just on time. And Great questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.